just tell him that in your own words revive me oh god you're all i want jesus you're the only thing that can satisfy us we just want you we just want you
call on that name right now. Your healing's in this place. Your deliverance is in this place. Your answer is here right now. All you have to do is call on the name of the Lord. So we call the name of
just lift your hands and begin to call out to him right now. Come on, cry out. Give him an invitation, Lord. Fill this place right now. God, we need you. We need you right now. We need you right now. That's it, that's it, that's it. Hallelujah, God. We need you here in this house right now, Lord. God, we need you. Amen. But I want us just with our voices right now, I want us to lift up our voice to the Lord and cry out. God wants to move in this house. He's looking for empty vessels that are hungry. Oh God. Oh God, I hunger for you. I hunger for you. Lord, I thirst for you, Father. God, we need you in this house right now. Your presence in this place, God. Come on, let it come from a deep place right now. Oh, God, I need you. I need you. We need you here. We need your presence in our midst, God. Hallelujah. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Come on, hungry hearts, crying out to God will make a difference. God will respond. Just cry out to Him. Lord, we need you. We need you in this place, God. We need you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I know some of you are wanting us to move on with the service, but I feel like God wants to stay, us to stay here for just a few more moments. Come on, let's keep, keep crying out to Him. God, we need you. We need you, Father. Yet I'm that I hunger for you, Lord. I hunger for you. I hunger for you. I hunger for you. Oh, God, I hunger for you. Yet that I'm a Sunday, and that I'm a Sunday, and that I'm a Roki Abosa. God, we hunger for you. Oh, God, we need you. Can't make it without you, Father. We need you in our midst tonight, God. We need your presence in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus is here tonight. He's in this house right now. Hallelujah. I thank you for what you're doing, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what I feel here. I'm so glad that you have stepped into this room tonight, God. We, Lord, there's nothing like your presence, nothing like your touch, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. I love you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We love you, Father. Thank you, Lord. So glad you're here tonight. So thankful you're in this place tonight. God, I feel you. I know you're here. I know you're here, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, we love you. Now, right now, why don't you tell him that? Tell him, Lord, I love you. Come on, let it come from your heart. Lord, I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I love you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing here. God, I thank you for your presence. Thank you for your sweet touch that's here tonight, God. I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, you're so good. Hallelujah. 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 God is so good. God is so good to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love you. The presence of the Lord. Oh, God is so good God it is so good God is so good come on let it come from your heart he's so good to me and I love you Lord I love you Lord I 
Precious, precious presence of God in this place. Amen. Something about getting our focus and our attention on the Lord. Amen. That makes our lives different. Amen. How many feel like you just need a renewing here tonight? You need God to revive your spirit? Amen. I believe that he's here to do just that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Turn around to somebody and wave at them. Tell them you love them with the love of the Lord. Just holler out. Amen. God bless you. Thank the Lord. Brother K, would you come? Amen. Lord, everyone, we're going to move into another form of praise and worship, and that's by the giving of our tithes and our offering. You may be seated. If you are giving by cash or check, please raise your hand. One of our ushers can give you an envelope. You can fill that out. We also have our giving kiosk in our back right, your back left. You can give by way of debit card uh, over there. And we also have our website, thepentecostals.today. You can click on the giving tab and give that way as well. While you are getting your tithes and offering ready, I want to say thank you to all of our guests for being here today. If you are a first or second time guest and you entered and did not get a, a first or second time guest card, please raise your hand. One of our ushers can give you that. We'd love for you to fill that out. We have something we want to give you after service. Nothing crazy. We're not going to make you come up or do anything. We just want, uh, just want to know that you're here, and thank you for being here with us today. And we also want to thank all of our online guests for checking in with us today and all of the guests on Revival Radio. Thank you for listening in and being with us today. Amen. If we'll please stand, we're going to go before the Lord with our tithes and offering. Let's pray. God, I thank you for what you've done in this service, and I thank you for what you're going to do. I ask that you bless this offering that we're about to give. I ask that it be used for the betterment of your kingdom. Let it be used to further your kingdom in this world, God. I thank you for what you've done, and I ask that you continue to bless this service with your presence. In your name we pray. Amen. You may now give your tithes and offering.
Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. You may be seated. Again, it is so good to see everyone in the house of the Lord this, uh, this evening. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Rob McKee. I'm the senior pastor here at the Pentecostals. And um, actually, that young lady that was just leading us in singing is my daughter, Savannah. And uh, my beautiful wife right over here. It's so good to have each of you in the house of the Lord with us today. And uh, I am so thankful for all that's happened. We've had some tremendous services today. Actually had three services this morning uh, to accommodate all the crowd, kind of spread all the crowd uh, around. And uh, some people are asking already, what are we going to do next weekend? We don't know. We'll see. Amen. I've, I've, you'll know before Sunday. Let's put it that way. Uh, but uh, we will do our best to try to stay on top of everything, keeping everyone safe. And, and uh, I'm just so thankful God has protected our church. I said it this morning. I'm going to say it again. We have been very fortunate. As far as we know, we have not had anyone hospitalized. Uh, we have had folks that have been, gotten sick, but no one hospitalized. Those that have gotten, amen, that's something to be celebrate, something to be excited about. Those that have gotten sick are doing better now. We've had some that, uh, many that got sick and within just uh, a couple of days, they were already doing better. And, you know, over all the symptoms, they were just, uh, now they're just waiting for the time so they can come back to church. So, amen, that's good. That's, we ought to celebrate that and be thankful for that. And uh, I, I want to also say how much I appreciate everyone uh, kind of working with us and working with the crazy schedule and working with all of our guidelines. I know uh, as far as I, again, um, as far as we know, we, everybody has, has kind of cooperated. We've, we've told folks, if you're having symptoms, please stay home. And everybody's done that. And uh, so thank God for that. We, have, um, we are uh, getting through all of this and it won't be much longer. And we're gonna, we're gonna make it through it all. So I'm so thankful for what God is doing. And uh, I believe we have a special song. We're going to, amen, all the ensemble. Come on, ensemble. Amen. And uh, in lieu of the choir today, we're, we've got a special uh, ensemble that's going to be singing. Amen. I appreciate all these folks so much and all the practice and hard work. And um, amen. All right. Y'all have a name for your ensemble? All right, well, I'll wait till they come up with a name for themselves. Uh, Y'all think about it, talk it, talking about it on yourselves, and uh, they'll come up with a group name. But we are, uh, we're so thankful for what the Lord is doing. Amen. All right. The Pentecostals, how about that? Pe Pentecostals praise team ensemble. All right. Why don't you put your hands together and let's welcome the ensemble as they come. In time you'll get involved Cause our God, He cares about us So wait on the Lord Wait on the Lord Wait on the Lord And He Straight. There's not a night too dark or a journey too long to embark. Jesus will see you through in time. He'll make you move. Cause our God, He cares about. Oh 
I'm going to wait on you, Jesus. 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 And I'm not turning back now. I'm not turning back now. No, I'm not turning back now. our way out 
we feel like the walls are closing in on us and we feel like we're just stuck in this waiting season everybody across the world right now is waiting god what's next month gonna bring what's next week gonna bring what's gonna happen this time what's gonna collapse this time who's gonna get sick this time we're waiting and we're waiting for what's next but we are the people of God and we don't have to wait for what's next because we know how the story is. Our God has already promised us that if we'll wait on him, if we'll trust him, if we'll praise him in the midst of our season, he's already promised us that we'll mount up on wings like eagles, that we'll walk and not get faith, that we'll run and we won't get weary. So I've come to declare to somebody that's weary right now where you are. You're weary where you're waiting. You're weary in your living room. Praise him in his head. promise you that he'll renew your strength. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. There's something about waiting on God, giving God whatever it is that he desires that makes an impact in our life, amen. When we give praise to God, amen, God will honor it. Thank the Lord, well, God is good, amen. Thank the Lord. Turn to somebody next to you and tell them God is good. And start singing the royal telephone, amen, I, amen. God is good. There's an old song we used to sing, they'd wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles oh they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint teach me lord teach me lord Wait, y'all. How many know that song? Y'all know that song? There you go. Help me. Shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord. To wait. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank the Lord. I love. I love songs that quote the word of the Lord. Something special. I love all kinds of gospel music, and I'm not saying you have to, but I just love songs that that quote scripture. And uh, it's, you know, the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the more that we ought to depend on God's word. Amen. Living for God was never supposed to be a matter of emotion. It's not just an emotional high and low. Because you're going to have days that you don't feel saved. Days that you don't feel sanctified. And at those moments, you better have enough word in you to know what you believe, who God is, and the direction you're going. Amen. I've said this for the last three or four weekends in a row. I want to challenge the church to get back into studying the Word of God. Let God's Word guide the path of your life. And again, a good way to do that is every day, just, you may be seated, every day, pray the Proverbs. Pray the Proverbs. And uh, 
Whatever the proverb is for the day, just pray it. And I believe that God will start talking to you and challenging some things in your life. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Lord willing, I'm going to either teach a lesson or I'll make a video or I'll do something. I've got a little something I want to share with, uh, uh, with the church called How to Study the Bible. For some people, we take it for granted that everybody understands how to study the Bible. But most of the time, it's just, you know, it's kind of like I was talking about Wednesday night. It's sort of like the magic eight ball. We just kind of shake it up and let something fall out of it and claim it's from the Lord. Uh, even if it's out of context and it doesn't make any sense, you know, we just kind of create things, allegorical definitions of what God is trying to say in Scripture. But I believe that the Word of God will speak directly to almost every issue that you will face in life. Amen. It's principles, it's precepts will, uh, will guide us. Amen. Well, it is such an honor today to have our friends of Seagraves uh, here with us with Andrew Seagraves, pastors just outside of Seattle, Washington in a suburb called Belleville. Um, I, I told him that's the name of a mental hospital here in Texas, but uh, amen. Thank God for other Bellevilles. Uh, but uh, I am uh, so honored to have him here. Some of you may not know, uh, but Brother Seagraves, he's, he's actually preached for us before, right? Didn't, yeah, you preached for us a while back and uh, did, did a tremendous job. But uh, his wonderful, sweet sister has moved down here with her three children and have become a part of our church. This is Sister Annette, uh, Sister Annette's uh, brother, okay? So now you know the connection. And uh, all of the Winslows, all these Washington crazy people, they, they all know each other. They're all connected somehow. And uh, but we are so honored to have the, uh, the Seagrace family here. His sons are, are here with him. And uh, we're so glad that they're here in the house of the Lord. I'll let him introduce his family. But um, I want us to welcome him. Put your hands together and let's welcome <laughs> Pastor Andrew C. Graves. Amen. God bless you, sir. Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. Before I get really into what the Lord is, what I thought the Lord had given me to speak tonight, the Lord gave me something this afternoon that just kind of changed direction a little bit. And I'm going to apologize in advance if I get a little bit emotional, but God's been so good, hasn't He? Amen. Second Corinthians 12.10 says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches and necessities. Go ahead and remain stand, uh, sitting, please. In infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I imagine when Paul wrote this and penned this, those that read it shook their head and wondered if he had maybe missed some sleep. But most of us are taught, or at least we catch the concept when we're growing up, of hiding our imperfections and not being open about our faults, our failures, our disabilities, our shortcomings. So you would never know just at first glance looking at someone. In fact, you may not know for a while. It could be years until probing into their personal life or when they open up and share with you. In fact, God is speaking to His people tonight and many are hiding pain and heartache behind a facade of everything's okay. I stand before you with a very obvious fault. It's not one that I'm real comfortable with, my family will tell you. It's my physical disability, failure, not as a whole physical person, but missing a limb due to one day having a knock on the door and opening that door to find tragedy that impacted my whole family rest of my life. However, I have been going through the process, Brother Wilson, Pastor McKee, of being fitted for a new prosthetic. Many of my close friends and my family will tell you that when I do have a prosthetic that's fitting right, you would never know that I'm missing a limb. I can walk without a limp. I hunt, I fish, I hike, I enjoy the outdoors. 
And yet, there is some here you are hurting spiritually. We come to church and we just go through the motions of a worship service and we're touched enough, but we have not turned it over to God. And yet, it's so such a dichotomy, it's such a twist that our culture, how we're raised, school, public school, college, the world around us, our jobs, teaches us and they, they ingrain in us that we want to try and hide those things that we see as failures and faults, mistakes, personal disasters that we have experienced in life. We put up a facade. We put up the fake front of a building to make it look much builder, or much, uh, much bigger, or much nicer than it actually is. However, when we come into church, whether you're online or you're here in person, and you stand before Him, we close our eyes and lift our hands and open our hearts. We stand before the Creator of all, of all mankind, and we are exposed and we can no longer hide our hurts, our pains, our disabilities, because God sees us as we are. But my weakness, because of my weakness, I am made strong. And when we get a hold of that in the Holy Ghost and realize my past has no bearing over my future, my fail failures do not dictate where I'm going, I might be low, but he is high. My weakness is his strength. I have a past. I have failures, but he never fails. I will have mistakes that will be made in my future because I'm human, but he is perfect. I can and I will forget to do things that I'm asked to do, but his timing is absolutely perfect. He is not a God made with humans' hands. Whatever you need, He will provide, and even some of your wants, because He's a good God. We try to plan ahead. We do. We fill out our calendars, and we need to. But we also need to understand that He is the master of time. So once again, can we stand to our feet can we lift our hands? And can we just be honest with God? You're, I'm not asking you to tell someone next to you. But can we lift our hands and open our hearts and just confess, God, I'm tired of hiding it all. I want to pour it out there for you. You see me as I am. My weakness is your strength. Can we just love the Lord? Can you open your mouths tonight? Can you just say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I need you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. All right, now I'll get ready to preach. Now that we got that out of the way, and this goofy crutch leg is explained, amen, it'll all be good as long as I don't fall and become some YouTube sensation. Stairs, they really scare me. I'm not going off the platform this way. So I like to. I like to walk around when I preach, but I've learned that you know, I have to kind of moderate it right now. I can do a wicked pirouette, but... Um, I've got to be careful. Amen. It is so good to be with you tonight here in Katy, Texas. Uh, we honor Pastor and Sister McKee, this great congregation, uh, our close friends, Dr. Wilson, Sister Wilson, the pastoral staff. And uh, I am just amazed as a pastor. I understand and I know that things don't just happen, but there are volunteers that make things happen. The, the church carries it, the faithful saints. Amen. Praise God. If you are a guest today, let this be your home. Amen. Amen. We like to have a preacher in our life, but we must have a pastor. We must have a pastor. Especially in times like now. Amen. Make this your home. 
Praise God. Amen, amen. Appreciated the messages today that Dr. Wilson brought. Amen. We were here for the 1130 service. We were told we could not come to any other service except 1130. So we were being obedient. Uh, but I did sneak on at 10, and uh, I appreciated the message he brought brought out to be brought in. Amen. That was wonderful. Praise God. If you turn your Bibles, be reading from Psalm 107, 1 Corinthians 1. I just want to make it very clear I'm not a long preacher. In fact, when I first started preaching, uh, the pastor would get up and he would announce, and uh, it was really strange. Everyone would stand up and start clapping. They were so excited. And I would usually be done in about 10 minutes. He usually preached an hour to an hour and a half, and it finally dawned on me. That's, that's not a thing of shame. They're appreciating a short preacher. Praise God. It's good to have uh, a lot of my family here. My younger sister, Annette, I'm her best brother, her only brother. That's all that matters. Amen. My wife is with me. I love to travel with my wife. We're also uh, privileged now that all of our kids are somewhat out of the house and uh, have two of, our, two of our three kids with us, both of our boys, our youngest, Preston, who lives in Austin. And uh, our oldest son, Cheston, who is going to Christian Life College. And uh, appreciate both these young men who love God. Amen. Good to have a close friend, uh, Glenn Moore, with us tonight. Amen. I was just thinking of a, a hole he fell in when we were younger, first time we met. Amen. I've got so many stories. It's, I need to be real careful. Praise God. Psalm 107, verse 19. It says, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word, and he healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Two parts that I want to bring to your attention. Verse 19, and it says, and he saved them. Verse 20, he sent his word. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18 for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Amen. I want to speak to you, to you for the next few moments about the power of the calling. The power of the calling. Amen. You can put your Bibles down. And we've been praying a lot and feeling the presence of God. But just turn around to someone near you and just say the power of the calling and you may be seated amen what wonderful music tonight great worship we miss home and we were following our service online we pastor in Bellevue Washington which is just on the east side of Seattle Cross Lake, Washington. Literally, we're maybe 10 minutes, 12 minutes from downtown Seattle, which at times is too close. And uh, it's been some crazy times that we live in. A lot of goofiness and craziness going on where men just allow themselves to go. And, and uh, we are seeing the spirit of the age come out in the world that we live in. Amen. Um, as a pastor, I just want to say this, and I want to clarify this. I am not an evangelist, okay? I am a pastor. I have a pastor's heart. I speak as a pastor. Um, I would be a very miserable evangelist, and I imagine most that I spoke to would be pretty um, disappointed as well. But as a pastor, I know my calling. I'm very secure in it. I know what God has called me to be. But the power of the calling remember as a young boy, I had severe learning challenges, and not knowing any better, um, I thought that uh, 
kindergarten and first grade were just an absolute great deal of fun. In fact, second grade was even better. I had so much fun. Didn't learn anything, but I had so much fun. And I enjoyed it so much that my parents had me take it a second time. And I had twice as much fun, but this time I did learn how to read. And I found out that that is a very important life skill, knowing how to read. And so from that age on, I began to read, and I was a voracious reader. I would read anything I could get my hands on, and uh, I read probably some novels and books that I probably shouldn't have at that age. And uh, during that time, it was my dad had some Alistair MacLean novels laying around. I read those. Um, I believe I was eight or nine years old, and those were just fascinating and It just took me to a different dimension when I began to read. But one of my favorite books was written by an author by the name of Jack London. And he wrote a book in the early 1900s called The Call of the Wild. How many of you have heard of that book? Raise your hand up high. Wow. Those of you who did not raise your hand, you need to find that book, an audio book or something. It is a classic book book. It is incredible. And the story of it, uh, the, the, the whole point of the story is it's written from the perspective, I guess, of a dog. That's, his name is Buck. And he was, uh, I guess, you can say a dog is born. So he was born in California, raised in California, had an easy life, lived on a ranch, a farm, and everything was great. And he was dog-napped. Terrible thing. And he was sent to the Yukon uh, gold fields right at the late 1800s, early 1900s. And Jack London was somehow able to encapsulate this dog's story. And it is so fascinating to read it. It just, it just pulls you in as you look at the day-to-day struggles. And I didn't know that dogs had challenges like this. I didn't know that they thought like this. We did a marvelous job of at least making it up. Uh, He must have had an incredible imagination. But towards the end of the book, it talks about the dog Buck sitting by the campfire. And there he is with the person who, I don't know if you could say owned him, but he was with, the man he was with. And that evening, they were in interior Alaska, and he began to hear the howl of a wolf in the distance. And there was something that began to stir within that dog's brain and its heart. And uh, that dog soon turned wild because it heard the call of the wild. But it was not just hearing that call, but it was the response of what it was doing to the heart of that dog and how it pulled that dog out. And yet, we look at that and we can kind of smile and think, well, that's a wonderful story, how cute that is. But what about when we walk into church and we begin to hear the call of God on our life? And there's something that begins to change and there's a quiver and our heart begins to beat faster. And we hear the worship and we just envelop ourselves in the worship and we love the worship of God and we hear the preaching of God and the conviction falls. And afterwards we have an altar service where God begins to stir up our heart because he sends his word. And there is a call that goes. When it comes to church, We need more than just another program. Programs are good. They have their place. And in their place and in their time, they are effective. But it's more than just a program. It's more than just a formula. It's more than just an algorithm that you come up with. We must have the anointing of God. And that is because there is a call on somebody's life that is responding to that call. And we begin to feel it in the Holy Ghost as God is pulling on us. There is a pressure in the ministry. There is a pressure that we feel. You would, you can call it the pressure of duty. All day today, my day was pretty well run knowing that I was preaching tonight. I get ready to preach and I get to the church and my heart starts beating a little quicker. I was sitting right back there in the back corner where I wouldn't trip too many people. 
And while I'm sitting there getting ready to preach, and I know it's coming time to the preaching, my heart starts beating faster and faster because there's something going on in the spirit, and I can feel it. I feel something pent up within me, and I feel the pressure of what I've got to deliver tonight. It's like the game that they have made so popular across the nation, worldwide, in fact, the call of duty. You go and you pick it up and you can play it. In fact, my assistant pastor is a doctor. He was telling me that he had a young man come see him. His parents brought him in, a teenage boy, and he told them, he said, I'm very sorry, but it's terminal. He has VGS. And they're like, oh, that's bad. He said, it is. It's terminal. Well, what do you do? Well, I'm going to prescribe this, okay? He's got to get a little bit more active, and you got to start slow each day, but more and more active. Well, what is VGS? It's called video game syndrome. Put it away. Get outside. You're raising up a child that's going to grow up in your basement and not know what else to do. He said, it's terminal. You better get on top of this soon. Those parents were nodding. Oh, okay. It takes a doctor to tell you that? The call of duty, the game, it just it enraptures people. They get lost in it. But this is not just a game. The call of duty that we feel is not just a game you go home and pick up when you want to. You don't just get with some friends and play online and think this is just great and put it down when you want to. But there is a call that comes from the heart. There is a call and anointing that does not stop. That's there when you wake up in the morning. It's there when you put your head on your pillow at night. You cannot get away from it. The pull of it. Saints of God. As adults, if you understand what I'm talking about tonight, you need to protect the call that's on your life. You need to nurture that call that's on your life. You need to grow that call that's on your life. You need to feed that call that's on your life. Unfortunately, some find out to their dismay that God's timing is perfect, ours isn't. And when we think and we begin to say and we begin to live that I'll wait till tomorrow, pastor, I'll wait till next week. I know God's dealing with me about it, but I'll just wait a while until I'm ready. Until it's too late. Hear this pastor preaching until it's too late. And over time, that calling gets fainter and fainter. I've worked in welding shops. I've worked in the oil field. And it is now the environment where you need to have safety precautions. And they talked about how that years gone by, you would walk into a noisy engine room or a turbine room. And you walk in there and the noise is just... It gives you almost a headache, and the old-timers would say, just wait a while, you'll get used to it. <laughs> you weren't getting used to it, your hearing was leaving you. Until you were stone deaf. And when we push God away, our hearing gets destroyed a little bit each time. Hear me, young person. If God is calling you, you need to respond. You need to grab a hold of that. Parents, grandparents, hear me, recognize the call that's on your family. Recognize the call and the hunger that's on your kids and your grandkids. Recognize what God is trying to do. Don't just throw them like you would into the deep end of a swimming pool, but nurture that. Help them understand what it is. Pray with them. Pray over them. Pray about them throughout your work day. Don't just let them go. That means that you must be familiar with the call that they're feeling. That means that you must be around the call. You must be at church. Don't expect just to send your kids and your family to church and let that be enough. It's not the pastor's responsibility to raise them. It's not his responsibility to be that bright, shining example. 
He is that and more. But that's not his place. This is a pastor speaking. When it comes to the call, recognize it. Be protective about it. Guard it. Guard the call that's on your family. You know what I'm talking about. God deals with different families in different ways. It's like God gifts them spiritual things and this one this and that one this and it runs in the blood it seems. Guard that. Understand what it is. Your children, your grandchildren, your spouse. If the case may be, your parents. Cautiously monitor what can impact and influence their life. Well, they're old enough, are they? I'm still learning things now that I need to go and ask my dad sometimes his experience with. I wish I was back in my late teens, mid and late teens. Brother Glenn, when I knew everything, life was so much easier. In fact, I knew so much I could have worked for the NSA, CIA, FBI. They should have been knocking on my door. I had all the answers. But something happened as I grew a little bit older. I realized I don't have all the answers. And I look back and I can see how my parents prayed over me. I can remember the nights hearing my name called out in prayer. In fact, I was a teenager. Hear me, I was a teenager. And I could not sleep until one of my parents came in my room and prayed with me. They used to laugh about it. We would all laugh together. If I ever got married, I'd have to stay close to home so one of them could come over and pray with me every night. We'd laugh, and it was funny, but I looked back, and I realized what was happening now, how they were pouring themselves into me. Those prayers that they prayed, I've got them stored in my mind. I have not forgotten those words I heard, the times that they were speaking in tongues, and I felt conviction in my life. Mom and dad, hear me. Grandparents, hear me. This day, we cannot just throw our children out the front door and expect them to walk on their own. We need to be there for them. Be aware of who is speaking into your family's life. Be careful who is positioning your children. As a young boy, I was privileged. My grandparents lived close enough. Mom and Papa Seagraves were pastoring in South Seattle. We were pastoring. My dad pastored in Longview, Washington. And each summer, my sisters and I would each have the opportunity to spend one month with Mom and Papa Seagraves. I loved it. It was a great time. It was a great influence. I remember one day I got up and had breakfast and... Papa Seagraves went to work, and my grandmother, Mom Seagraves, was fixing breakfast. And after I ate, everyone else was gone, and she was going about her day at the house. And so I wandered outside and went around the block until I found a group of boys. And we began to play. We were boys. We were definitely all boy. If we found rocks, we'd throw them because that's what boys do. You uh, find glass bottles, you want to break them. That's what boys do. And so we were out playing on the far side of the block. My grandmother is at home. And one of the boys, their mother, called to them around noon about lunch. And I thought, well, I better head back and eat. too. I'm getting hungry. So I went back to my grandparents' house. And I went in and I walked in the door. And it was all hot. It was very warm out. My grandmother said, you need to go wash your hands. So I went in the bathroom washing my hands. And I remember looking up and seeing her standing behind me in the doorway. She just stood there, and as I finished washing my hands, I felt like I was under the gaze of God. She said, Andrew, the young boy, and she told me what he was wearing, described his shirt, described his hair color. She pointed her finger at me and said, stay away from him. There is a spirit attached to that family. And she turned and walked back in the kitchen. I was scared to death. 
I went in the kitchen, I ate my lunch, and decided I would stay at the house and read for the rest of the afternoon. But thank God for a grandmother who was sensitive to God. We were just young boys. Could it have been death-defying? Well, at that age, who knows? But the trouble, I, I don't know. The influence, the words that were spoken, who knows? But I'm so thankful for grandparents and parents who were sensitive to God. We find in the Old Testament, the Scriptures make mention many times of the the sons of the prophets. Sons of the prophets. And I got to tell you, I, sometimes when I'm reading the Bible, Dr. Wilson, I'm not real spiritual. And the first thought that would come to mind is they were the sons of the prophets. Number one, whoop de doo Number two, what happened? Somewhere there was a link that was broken. Somewhere there was a godly parent that allowed their children to settle for second or third best and did not point it out. This is just, I'm just being very transparent and honest. This is what I was thinking is, if that's a son of a prophet, then why aren't you a prophet? What happened in your life? What decisions were you allowed to make as a young person that burnt those bridges? Could it be that they couldn't let go of an earthly pursuit that they put above the calling of a prophet? Could it be that they did not have a parental influence, even a peer that would say, that's not wise, son. That's not wise. So tonight, if you don't remember anything else, think of this. Instead of seeing and encouraging your children to settle, encourage them to pursue God. Encourage them constantly to put God first. Don't settle for second or third place, but encourage them to stay late at church and pray. You can go without a little bit of sleep instead of rushing off on a Sunday night. You can leave work maybe just a few moments early so your family can get to church on time during the middle of the week. You can just take some personal sacrifices to make sure that your children are plugged into the youth group and they're around godly influences. I told you this is a pastor's heart. These are things that bother me. These are things that hurt me in the spirit when I see it. Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9 then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. There's something about getting the Holy Ghost on the inside. Young person, there's something about grabbing a hold of that raw electrical cord of the Holy Ghost. And realizing this is what I want in my life. I don't have to choose between the calling and the career. But if I pursue the calling, the career will fall into place. Parents, grandparents, help direct your family. Help guide them into the calling and the blessings of God. Be sensitive to the spirituality, the spiritual calling that's on your children. Be listening for it at night. Be watching to see what they're reading. Be praying for them. Be fasting for them. There's nothing wrong, parents, with letting your kids or your family know I'm not eating today. You don't have to say a whole lot more. But just start fasting for them when they reach those points in life. What else can you do but encourage them? Make sacrifices as parents and grandparents so that they can get plugged into the Holy Ghost. Make personal sacrifices of time and effort and finances, if that's what it takes, to see them in a place, position where God can use them. 
I'm not ashamed to say that I have done everything in my power growing as a young family to position my family where God could touch them. My wife and I made sacrifices. We did things at times when we didn't have the money so that our kids could be around the right influences to make those sacrifices. Musicians, if you would come. Last time we were here just seems like four weeks ago or so, made mention of that within this congregation there are pillars, there are spiritual pillars of great families. And again, great families don't just happen. There's an intentionality, intentional lifelong family focus of getting behind the pastor, getting behind the leadership of the church, and being there as a support, even when we're not noticed, just supporting, just being there, being a help, doing what we can. It takes work. It takes planning. It takes sacrifice as parents. But I'd rather make those sacrifices now and know that my children are serving God than to not ever make those sacrifices and just hope they figure it out. I learned at a very young age that I have to plan for my future. Financially, I found out it was actually from a man I was working with. I was 27 years old and I was working and he came up to me and I look back and I'm so appreciative now of it. He got in my face and he said, hey, how much are you putting in your 401k? By the way, this is just free financial advice, okay? Just free. Just take it to heart and understand, and yes, this is spiritual. And I told him, I said, we can't afford that. We can barely afford groceries. And oh my word, that guy got red in the face. Pastor, he got nose to nose with me, and he was all but yelling. He said, you are foolish. Whoa. I know what that word means. That's not just something you say just kind of, you know, as an add-on word. He meant it. He said it with conviction. You're foolish. You're leaving money in somebody else's bank, and they're trying to give it to you. Now, that got my attention. What he said next was pretty incredible. He said, Andrew, it might be tight now, but if you don't do this now, you're going to be worse off later in life. So this man became like a father figure to me in this aspect. He said, why don't you put 3% aside in your 401k? And if you don't have enough money for groceries, I will buy your groceries for a month. And I know a good deal. And I smiled. I shook his hand. And I said, you're on. Man, I burned my way up to see the HR director. I signed up for my 401k. And wouldn't you know it, that man was right. It might have made a dollar or two difference in my paycheck. It was so little. Of course, I wasn't going to go to him then. But I realized what my financial future meant. He taught me so much that one morning before we opened the store for work. Pentecostals of Katy, let this be a wake-up call. If you don't plan now for your family, spiritually, you're going to be hurting later. Make up your mind. Draw a line in the sand. I want my family to be saved. Our culture has totally messed up and twisted the meaning of success. And if I said this last time, well, you're meant to hear it again twisted the meaning and perception of success. And I enjoy reading different financial magazines and newspapers. And they're usually talking about this one or that one who is freshly minted successful. And culture promotes success as an individual personal 
accomplishment. But when you study it in Scripture, now I want this, I want this very clear. I'm on record, I guess, so I want this very clear. This is, I'm not talking about a prosperity doctrine. I'm just talking about life. Just life. But modern culture promotes success as an individual. But when you study Scripture, success flows from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. That's what success is. Scripturally, success has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with your life as a whole, your spiritual well-being. Life is like a three-legged stool. You have your career, you have your family, and you have your spiritual life. If one is missing, you can't sit on it. Your life is messed up. But it's keeping a balance between those three. Get a hold of that. Luke refers to that if you want to know. Luke 1 and 50, it talks about generation to generation. If you would stand with me. The Apostle Paul wrote in Acts 18 and 5, and he said, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit. He was pressed. There is a pressure of duty that we feel in life. As we become parents, and those of you who are grandparents, there's, there's, a, there's the pressure of duty of your family especially when we look at the spiritual responsibilities we have there's a compelling there's an urging there's an unction there's an anointing and all of those things are pressing us we feel moved on but tonight in this service and again this is just a pastor talking what is God calling you what is God what kind of a call is God putting on your family where is God leading your family? That call of duty that we have. The scripture speaks of in Matthew twenty two fourteen. 14, Jesus said, for many are called, but few are chosen. Unfortunately, many people hear the call of God and they feel the call of God, but they want just the quick fix. They want the drive-through version. They want the just one service and it's taken care of. But the call that God puts on our life is a lifetime. Young man, hear me if you feel called to preach. You might feel called on a Sunday night, but Monday you probably won't get a phone call to go preach someplace. In fact, it could be years before you are invited to speak somewhere. That does not take away from the call, though. That call is still there. But God's perfect timing must take place. And let it be said tonight of this generation, Psalm 24 and 6, this is the generation of them that seek Him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Let it be said that this generation standing here in this congregation tonight is the generation of them that seek Him. We feel the call, the call of duty. We feel that the power of the call. But now it's time to respond. Can we lift our hands all across this auditorium? Can we lift our hearts and let the humble words of this speaker reverberate in your brain for a few moments and allow God to touch you tonight. Allow God to pull on you a little bit tonight. Allow God to reveal things in your life, in your family. Allow God to move tonight.
my desire passionately is to be what you've called me to be that's what I'll be hallelujah hallelujah thank you Jesus amen Brother C. Graves thank you for that word that was from the Lord tonight amen I the psalmist David wrote, I believe in, in uh, Psalms 145 and verse 4, he said, One generation shall praise thy works to another. And then he said that that generation is going to pr- declare his mighty acts to another generation. I believe Psalms 102, I think verse 11, talks about how that uh, David said, You need to write down these words so that a generation not yet created, not yet born, could declare these works of God. There's some things that we all have to establish in our life that are going to outlive us. Amen. The true measure of success is what happens when we die. Amen. The success of our soul happens after we die. The success of our life here on earth happens after we die. The success of our, of, of our influence on others' lives happens after we pass. Is what, is what we're doing here on earth going to make a difference beyond our existence here? And I, I believe that if we're living for God and we're sowing good things in our family and sowing good things in others, that, that everything that we do is going to make an impact in somebody else's life. Amen. Amen. I realize that there are a host of ages, a plethora of of different uh, stages in life, people who have grown kids, others have kids that are just, uh, you know, just entering into life, toddlers, babies. But I I wonder if we could take just a moment. I'm going to ask all of the parents, if you're standing next to your children, I want you to reach out and I want you to begin to pray for them right now. If you're near your children, reach out and make contact with them. Hallelujah. And I want you to pray. Pray that God would help you to make an influence, make a difference in their life. Those of you that your kids are maybe not here with you, I want you to intercede for your children right now. Hallelujah. I want you to begin to pray for them. God hears all. He knows everything. But I want you to pray. God, help me to make a difference in my family's life. God, help me, Lord. I'm going to sow good things. Yes, Lord Jesus, God, I ask you, Lord, help us, God, this family is divine together, Lord. God, to transfer something to our children. Let them know that you are what matters in our life, God. That's what I'll be. Bless our families, strengthen our families, Lord. I'll say yes. Oh, Lord, I agree. Lord, I agree. Passionately, passionately is to be what you call us to be. And that's what I Blessings of God flow through family. Maybe you're here today and your family's not living for God. I want to give you a word of encouragement. God can still work through you. You're watching online and you're thinking, man, my, my, my family's so far from God. If you put good things in them, there's going to be a reward. There's going to be an impact in their life. Just trust what you've been sowed into their lives. That God's going to turn it all around. You know, I think through the Old Testament, anytime there was a 
There was a leader that was anointed. The congregation was called and families were selected. First the tribe and then the family until, until one patriarch comes forward and, and then they call someone from that house, from a particular household. That's what happened when there was a blessing or a leader that was anointed. But the same thing happened when there was judgment, such as the case with Achan. They brought all the congregation together and families and tribes and then, and then a household. I want to make sure that my family, I set up and I lead my family to a blessing and not a curse. I want to make sure that when my family is called from the congregation and, uh, and, and the Lord brings us up before the throne, I don't know how he's going to do it, but I, I just believe he's going to call us forward by families. When that moment happens, I want to make sure that the Lord is pronouncing blessing on us and not a curse. Amen. Praise God. Thank you again, Brother C. Grace, for that word today. Did you enjoy that tonight? Amen. Thank the Lord. We want to have stronger families. For those of you that are not married and you're looking for a wife, foul this one away. You need it. Amen. Everything is, uh, is beneficial to us. Amen. To all of our guests that are here tonight, I want to say thank you for being in the house of the Lord. I hope that you've enjoyed something. Uh, if you know, every service, I usually say this on Sunday morning, but every service in an apostolic church is different. Every service is different. There's no two apostolic services alike. And so in order, if you're looking for a church home, in order to know whether or not we're the church for, you're going to have to come at least six times. We call it stick six. You stick six and you'll, you'll be able to make an educated decision on whether or not we're the church for you. But we love you and we're so honored to have you here. Thank you for being with us. For those that are watching online, we love every one of you. Hoping to see you all soon. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in the fear of the Lord. Amen. Let's go change our world. Let's make a difference in this generation.